Sure thing. All right, well, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this Lunch and Learn. Um, we're excited today to have Dr. Ballard with us and uh, to present some of uh, the research that she does and um, to explain perhaps how medical students and other students might fit in um, to those research lines and um, the types of work that, she, that they might be able to assist her on. Um, I'll let her do her, her own uh, introduction uh, because she can probably do it better than I can. Uh, but let's welcome Dr. Ballard. And I would like to mention that this is being recorded. So uh, any student at any point in time could watch this, this uh, session and um, could possibly reach out to Dr. Ballard uh, later on um, as they view this uh, video. So we have a YouTube channel um, where we post all of these. And so this will be one of those uh, videos that contributes to our library. So Dr. Ballard, we're so excited to have you join us and to share about the exciting work that you've been doing. And it's the very cool work that I think a lot of people wish they could do. And you're actually doing the thing that we always wanted to do when we were kids. So uh, thank you for joining us and I'll, I'll pass the uh, mic to you um, to introduce yourself and then to tell us about your research. Sure, I guess that means I never really grew up. But <laughs> um, so I am Holly Ballard and I'm Associate Professor of Anatomy and Paleontology. And um, so I teach first year med students in anatomy, but my research seems like it's completely different. It's on um, primarily dinosaurs, but other extinct animals too. And um, the tie in there is that you really have to understand anatomy of animals today to understand animals that are no longer alive. So that's the anatomy tie in and why we as paleontologists have to be really good at understanding anatomy and physiology. But I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Oh, if that's okay, if someone can give me permission, please. Okay, there you go. Okay, thank you. And I have a little PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation set up here um, with lots of cool images of what I do. And I'll just start by saying that um, in my lab, I, I study paleohistology, and um, it's sort of a weird lab in that we do this with, you know, everything from pickaxes to power tools out in the field and in the lab. So it, it's a little different than the standard lab setup, but I'll, I'll go into that in a minute. So my research interests as a paleohistologist is to use modern bone histology to understand the lives of things that are long dead. And like I said, this includes dinosaurs, but it can include anything really that has a backbone and legs and is extinct. So my research is broken down primarily into two different components. There's the field work component and then the lab component. And the great thing is, is that uh, comm students and and undergraduates and graduate students can assist me with either of these and it would be amazing to have that kind of help. So I'll go into both of those and what you could do to help if you're interested. So a little bit more about paleohistology first, just to see if this is something for you. Um, paleohistology is the study of fossil bone microstructure. So on the left here is a fossil bone and just like modern or, um, or non-fossilized bones, if you look inside it, you're gonna see the, the typical bone structure. So you're gonna have the bone shaft with the marrow, you're gonna have the growth plate on the end. And um, the really cool thing is that the, the fossil histology looks very similar to actual bone histology today. And if we were to slice transversely through the bone shaft of a fossil bone, you'll see something pretty similar to what you would if you did this in a human or uh, another animal today. And that includes, you know, holes where vascular canals travel through, uh, pits where the bone cells, the osteocyte lacunae live, and also the bone mineral itself. So it's super exciting that, you know, these bones that are fossilized over millions of years still preserve that same information. And so just to give you a, a better idea of what you're looking at, up on the top left is a thin section slide of a fossil dinosaur bone. 
And looking under the microscope, the marrow cavity and all the, the holes in the bone are where light can shine through. So they're kind of white. Um, the bone itself is sort of stained brown just because it's been buried for so long. But what you're seeing in this transverse section is basically the top of this pizza pie slice that you see in the little schematic here. And the important thing or the reason I make thin slices of fossil bone is because we know by looking at modern animals that when we look at the bone tissue, the growth rate that we, we observe in living animals is correlated with the bone tissue organization as well as the vascular density. So in these two images at the top, on the left, we have a bone tissue histology in an elk and the bone histology of a rhea, which is a large bird. And in these images, the bone is the beautiful sort of pinks and reds and oranges. The black squiggly lines through the bone, that's where the blood vessels are. And then the little tiny specks that you see are where the bone cells are, the osteocyte lacunae. And both of these animals, the elk and the rhea, grow very quickly to adult size. Uh, the elk takes several years to get there. But in both cases, a high amount of vascularity and a lot of those bone cells, uh, that basically implies together that these animals are growing rapidly. And uh, today, the animals that consistently show this type of bone tissue are warm blooded. This looks way different from the condition we see in living reptiles today, for the most part, like these alligators here. So this bone tissue type that we see with the alligators, you can tell there's a lot of differences here. The, the blood vessel canals are circular, they're sort of sparse, they're not very dense, and the tiny little specks are not as disorganized and crazy looking and all over the place like we see in the mammal and the bird. So just relatively, we can look at these things and get an idea based on, on the animal and its physiology, what that uh, relates to as far as bone tissue organization and structure. So for example, in, in depth here, this is another example of um, an elk bone and we're just sort of zooming in to the outer cortex here. And so the vessel canals I pointed out with some um, blue arrows there. We also have growth rings and they're really cool. They're like, um, they're basically the animal equivalent of tree rings. So through modern studies, we know that every year an animal will pause its growth temporarily, usually during winter and then resume growth in the spring. And this leaves behind rings in the bone. And just like tree rings, you can count those and figure out how old the animal was when it died, which is pretty amazing. And because we are studying this in modern animals and we understand what it means in modern animals, we can look at something like this dinosaur bone um, and, and we can see the same structures so we see holes where vessel canals were, and we see those same rings, and we can infer that it means the same thing. So in both this image and in the elk, we're seeing two years of growth with these rings, and we're seeing a lot of blood vessel canals. So just comparatively, we can start figuring out how, in this case, this little dinosaur pictured in the bottom right was growing and living, which is pretty much the, the purpose and intent of my work um, is to try to understand the growth and physiology of things by looking at these comparisons. The really cool thing, I think, is that by doing this and looking at numerous animals of the same species, for example, this tiny little dinosaur, this type of species from Australia is about the size of a turkey. And if I sample a lot of specimens and look at the histology, I can get an idea of their growth over time. So what this big image is showing you is a cross section through one of the bones in the leg of this dinosaur. And the marrow cavity I've outlined in pink. And as an animal grows up, marrow cavity gets bigger. So some of that earlier growth record is lost but you can still see remnants of it within the cortex as traced by those rings. 
So what I've done here is traced every ring I could find in this bone and sort of guessed at the, the rings that were somewhat missing because the marrow cavity got bigger. And so I can figure out that this particular individual was about five years old when it died. You can count the rings, there's five. Um, so it, it was five and a little bit when it died. The cool thing is that if you do this with enough animals from that particular species, you can end up with, with producing growth curves. So for this graph, every red point on there is an individual from this particular species that I've looked at histologically in this way. I count the growth marks, and in this case, I measure the tibia length, and I can get an estimate of the average growth of this animal over many years. And it turns out that this particular type of dinosaur took about um, between five and seven years to get to its tiny turkey adult size. So uh, it's pretty amazing to me that we can piece that sort of information together just by understanding what the bone tissue tells us. And for my lab, I, I'm really excited about working in the lab, but every summer I have to get out. <laughs> um, there's only so much you know, uh, fluorescent lighting you can take. So in the summers for typically in a typical summer, I know um, with the pandemic, it hasn't really been that way. But normally every summer, I will take a crew out to Montana for about three weeks, somewhere within June and July. And uh, there is a bone bed in Montana full of dinosaurs that I've been working on since um, I was working on my PhD dissertation. And one of the things with my research is that I need a lot of samples. In order to make that growth curve that I showed you, I, I need more than a couple of dinosaurs. I need to understand the growth and how much variation there is in that growth by using many dinosaurs. So I need to keep going out and sampling more. And so I go out to Montana every summer. I take volunteers from the comm, from undergraduates. Um, I try to source them locally from Oklahoma, but I've had uh, graduates and undergraduates come from across the United States and internationally to do this. And the image on the left here is the field site that will work typically for three weeks. And um, so that's in the foreground. The background is the Rocky Mountain front. And the image in the upper right, I. I want to expose students who or um, volunteers that have not been um, to that part of the world to the really cool things that you can find in Montana. So we do take excursions. Um, in this case, last time we were up there, I took my crew to Glacier National Park. And this is one of the vista views for one of the trails that we went on. So lots of opportunities to dig dinosaurs, also lots of opportunities to get out into nature. So. Um, it's been pretty successful, I'd say, over the, the several years that I've been doing this. These are all of the comm students that have participated so far. We can get a couple of students every year, every other year that will come out. Um, um, most of them, uh, I guess, um, Zach and Damiana are, I think, in their fourth year, and um, Will and Casey are in their third year. So. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for more volunteers in the future um, to keep this trend going it would be great. So that's the field work aspect of my research to collect fossils on loan from a museum, bring them back to my lab and look at them. And so that leads to the second opportunity for work in my lab. And you can see within my lab, I've got tons of these fossils all of them from that one site. And you really need not only to look at these fossils, but to look at modern animals, because it's really funny in a way that we know, I think at this point, we're more familiar with fossil bone histology than we are with modern bone histology. And that has a lot to do with the fact that you can look at an animal today and see how it's growing. So. In the past, why have we ever needed to look at the bone histology to tell us this thing gets to adult size in three years and is warm-blooded? 
But now we're starting to understand that there's a lot of physiological correlations that we don't yet understand or know about. And this is really the only record we have if we want to go back and try to understand the physiology of extinct animals. So what I'm hoping that I can recruit some comm students to help me with is to help me build a modern bone histology database. And right now I, I do have a couple of med students helping me in my lab, and I'm hoping this can be an ongoing thing as well. Um, these animals that I'm showing examples of here are um, animals that I have bones of in my lab currently. It's not all of them, but here's just an example. It's silly that we don't really know, for example, how um, how a llama grows from, you know, its bone histology. We know how a llama grows, but what does that look like in the bone? Same with a squirrel, you know, <laughs> it's just these, these things don't seem like much, but they can really help us understand the physiology of extinct animals a lot better. And I guess the most important and interesting thing for you guys would be that each of these animals, just to do the project, do the histology, it's a paper because no one's really published a detailed description, for example, of llama histology. So it's something that you can easily do over um, a period of one or two years, depending on how much research credits you wanna take. And you know, I will walk you through the entire process. Um, so just to give you an idea of what that process would be, and the process that I'm gonna outline here is with fossil dinosaur bone, but it's the same process for modern bone. So we have fossil bones. We take the pieces that we're interested in out of the middle of the bones, the bone shaft. They get embedded in a plastic resin to make them hard and um, resistant to cutting because we want to take thin slices out of them. Then here comes the power tools again. I have uh, several different uh, tile saws in the lab, depending on the size of the bone. And uh, we take a, a wafer of bone out of these embedded pieces. So that's what you're seeing on the image on the left and in the middle here are wafers of bone. And on the right, I've glued one of those wafers to a thin section slide. Then here goes some more power tools. We have a lapidary wheel and through progressively finer grit papers, basically sandpaper, we start polishing these bones until they're thinner and thinner, usually about 100 microns in thickness. And then we've got bones that we can actually pass light through and look at on a microscope. And so here's a picture of me pointing out bone tissue histology of, in this case, a Tyrannosaurus rex. But uh, again, we can do that with modern bone and fossil bone. And what I really wanna do is be able to have this library of modern bone where I can see something weird in a fossil bone and say, huh, that's interesting, but I've seen this before in this animal that's alive today. So I wonder if it means the same thing. That's what I'm trying to get at with this, um, with the participation that I'm hoping that uh, UCOM students would be interested in helping me with. So um, with that, I'll just, in my presentation, I did want to point out that the background image here is bone tissue from a Tyrannosaur. Um, so all the pinks are bone and the black um, squiggly lines are vascular canals. The specks are osteocyte lacunae. And I just wanted to point out that this is really scientific stuff, but it's also gorgeous and very artistic and beautiful. So um, there's also some capacity here if you wanted to tie in bone histology with outreach um, to tie in that with uh, visual artistic outreach as well as um, developing programs to take to Eugene Field, for example, because kids love looking at things uh, on the microscopic scale. So those are just a few ideas I have and I'll go ahead and end it and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Dr. Ballard. I had a couple of questions. Um, I'm the Cherokee Nation campus um, research representative. So um, I was, are you currently looking for students in your lab? And are you still planning on having this summer um, trip? Is that going to be happening? Do you know? 
So as far as the summer trip goes, right now it depends on what Oklahoma State decides. Right now, uh, because of the pandemic, there's a policy that students cannot travel out of state on educational purposes. So um, once that's lifted, then yes, we can go, but it's sort of, I'm in a holding pattern for this summer so far, um, just because that hasn't been lifted. And I know it's gonna depend on how the vaccination rollout proceeds. Um, so I've been telling people if they want to send me an email and get put on a list, um, I totally understand if at the point, you know, a decision is made, they've already made their summer plans, that's fine. but you know, as soon as I know something, I can send out an email and let other people know something. Um, but in a typical year, around February is where I, when I start recruiting for the field. Um, and then regarding the lab work, um, starting in the fall, I will need more comm students to do uh, projects that I listed out. So um, that would be a huge help. Are these projects that the Cherokee Nation campus students could do from where they're located as well, or would they have to go on site to Tulsa? They would need to come on site to Tulsa to do most of the work. Um, if they were able to work with, uh, usually I've had pairs of students both in the field and in the lab working. So if they're able to work with a student that could do the histology processing in my lab, and then they could work together to um, process the data remotely, that would that would be fine. Okay. Um, I might just reach out to you afterwards then to get a summary that I can post to our class's Slack page because people look there more than email sometimes. Gotcha. Sounds good. Dr. Ballard, mm -hmm. within the context of a research rotation, so um, when the students become third and fourth years, they have these, mo these months. Um, yep. They can currently do two months of time where they rotate. If they were interested in doing, say, some of the lab work that you discussed, mm -hmm. um, would there be a possibility for them to maybe have some intensive training, say, in a month or two, um, to be able to be more self-sufficient um, to complete some of that work? And uh, could they come back um, during some of their lighter rotations to continue um, in the lab as they had time but, weren't, but didn't have actually dedicated research time that month to do it? Yes, definitely. So the way I've been structuring this so far is to train the comm students in everything that they would need to do to get the project done, either on the specific animal that we'll be working with or on, you know, a practice bone. Um, but I would walk them through step by step because I want them to be able to understand the process and do it themselves. And it really doesn't take that long to get good at doing the processes and then they're basically self-sufficient at that point and once the thin sections are made i make appointments and sit down with the students on a one-on-one -on -one basis and just explain to them what they're seeing help them start making histological descriptions and right now with the two com students i'm working with they are currently working on the description part and we're going to put that together in a paper on and I'm going to be last author and they're going to be first and second authors. We're hoping to submit to Journal of Anatomy when we're done. I have one more question. Can faculty go with you on your exciting research trips? Yes, definitely. I, like I said, I have a, a, um, a mailing list that you know, just send me an email, tell me you're interested, then I'll send you the information. Typically, this time each year is where I start giving more information about the, the particular dig and the details. But in general, again, on normal years with no crazy pandemic stuff happening, it's a three week um, adventure excavation um, in Montana. And if you are able to get yourself to Montana, flying, driving, whatever, um, then the site itself has Wi-Fi, electricity, um, flushing toilets, shower. Um, you do have to camp unless you want to drive 40 minutes to town and get a hotel room. Um, but uh, when you're there, I can provide the food <laughs> and the transportation. So I'll pick you up from the airport and so on. Um, you don't need to know anything about digging or dinosaurs. The really cool thing about the experience is that 
um, especially for med students, having taken anatomy, um, they can see in the field, you know, uh, a dinosaur femur that, you know, is like two or three times as long as ours, but it still looks like a femur, um, ribs, vertebrae. So with just that basic anatomical knowledge, the students can start actually identifying the dinosaur fossils that they're finding. And, you know, I come over to help map it, um, you know, to document where they're finding it, but they're telling me, oh, I found a vertebra or, you know, I found a metatarsal. So it's really exciting to see that connection. And it comes really easy to students that have that anatomical background already. Are there any other questions for Dr. Ballard? Well, Dr. Ballard, thank you very much for taking time to talk to us today. Uh, this was a very informative uh, talk for me um, because I knew generally what you did, but not specifically. And I feel like I have a much better understanding now about uh, the types of, of research that you do. Awesome. And, uh, so, so we appreciate you coming and, and joining us today. And uh, we'll make sure that uh, Kyle and Ashton are, get the word out uh, regarding this and that students can watch it at a later time. And uh, we'll make sure that um, you're contacted uh, by interested students um, in hopes that we can actually do something in the summer. Yep, if not this summer, then we'll let students know about it next summer. But Right, <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much. All right, thanks.